So now the floor is yours, Michele. You have 30 minutes minus four. No, you reset. <laughs> so, and the discussion will be done by Peter Karadi. OK, thank you very much. Thanks to the organizer for including our paper. And thanks for everybody to come to the last session at, uh, on Friday afternoon. So what am I going to present today? Non-essential business cycle. This is joint work with uh, Paolo Surico, who is in the audience and is still from LBS, and uh, <laughs> Natalie Ricard, who is uh, from LBS, and she's a PhD student, and she will be on the market uh, the coming year. OK, so what do we do in this paper? In this paper, we try to see whether the split between essential and non-essential can amplify business cycle and can drive uh, um, distributional consequences of business cycle. So let's fix ideas. What is a non-essential? A non-essential is a consumption uh, good or a service whose, income, whose share increases as you become richer. An example could be eating at restaurants. If people become richer, they devote a higher consumption share to do that. A non-essential is something which is the opposite, like grocery shopping or utilities. The definition is that the income elasticity of demand is greater than one for an essential. Now, let me motivate the paper with four facts. The first fact is an angle curve. So what I'm showing you here in this graph is a cross-earning decile in the US economy, the proportion of non-essential consumption share. Now, the first thing might not surprise you, and almost by definition, as people become richer, they consume a higher share of non-essential. What I think is more interesting from this graph is that uh, non-essential consumption is something which is broad-based in the US economy. Starting from the poorest household to the richest household, we see that everybody consumes a substantial amount of non-essential consumption. The second fact is the flip side of this, but rather than con on consumption, on the labor market. Again, here I'm showing you across earnings decile in the US economy, how, whether people work in essential or in non-essential. And here we see the opposite pattern. Poorer households are more likely to work in non-essential than richer households. An example could be servers at restaurants who are relatively poorer, and they work in non-essential. Now, these are two cross-sectional facts, and then I'm going to give you a time series one. This shows you the path of consumption and labor earnings following a start of an MBR data recession. In orange, and I'm going to use orange throughout the talk for this, I'm showing you non-essential. Consumption in the first panel, and labor earnings in the second. In green, I'm showing you the counterpart for essential. What do we see? When a recession hits, households cut their non-essential consumption a lot, by more than 3% following one year from the beginning of the recession, and they cut much less their essential consumption. And we see the same pattern, even more striking, on labor earnings. Households who produce non-essential, uh, non they see their labor earning decline by about 2.5% after two years, whereas we see much muted effects on, for people who produce essentials. And now, given these three facts, uh, I can give you the paper in one slide. It's 5 p.m., it's, al it's almost 8 p.m., so you know, I, I hope I will get your attention throughout the talk, but if you want to remember one slide from the paper on the presentation, it should be this one. Okay, so let's say that there is a recession, maybe because of a monetary policy shock, which lowers household income. We know, and we show, that people cut their non-essential consumption. Why? Because non-essential is easier to anticipate or to postpone in the face of economic adversity. Now, why does this matter? Because this can affect poor people in two ways. First, as rich people substitute away from non-essential toward essential, the relative price of essential increases, and because poor households mainly consume essential, this makes them poorer. But also, and more importantly, as people cut non-essential, the firms who hire workers in non-essential will cut their labor demand and the earning of people who work in non-essential will fall. And as we know that this is mainly poor people, this is going to drive the earnings of low-income workers down. An example is when there is a recession, people don't go to the restaurant anymore. Who loses their job? Servers were relatively poorer. Now, why do we care for amplification? Well, we care about that because poorer households in general have higher MPC. And then because they have higher MPC, they further cut their aggregate spending and then this lowers aggregate demand, and then this lowers household income, and then we have a cycle, a non-essential business cycle. That's the paper. However, remember, I, pro I promised you four facts, and only gave you three so far. And the last fact is a time series application of the same, of, of non-essential consumption share. What I'm showing you here is the non-essential consumption share built with a consumption, uh, chain consumption index from the 60s until the recent period. 
And you might not have seen this before, it might not be surprising to see that as the economy became richer, the share of non-essential consumption has increased. Or in the sexual transformation, people have, have, see, have, show, have shown it, but not with this, not with this, not with this uh, data, possibly. However, the point here is that if you believe the story that I'm going to tell you today, the channel is going to become, likely to become more important. So amplification to this channel of business cycle might become stronger. And with this, I can summarize what we do in this paper, what our contribution. We have three separate ones. The first is a data one. We build a macro time series at monthly frequency for essential and non-essential, starting from micro data. We build this from consumption, prices, labor earnings, and as the project progresses, we're gonna make this available to other researchers. We are gonna use this time series to identify this new channel of business cycle amplification. And the story is what I just told you. People don't cut non-essential in a recession. These Hurstburg households we have IM, we work mainly non-essential, and because they have high MPC, this creates amplification. Now, as a first step, we show this with, uh, when we model monetary policy shock. I think this is important for an audience at the ECB. And, um, but however, we don't really tie our hand to the fact of this being only a monetary policy transmission, but we think this as a broader business cycle amplification. So we also show that this channel is present with main business cycle shocks. And then finally, we use the intuition that uh, non-essential are easier to anticipate and postpone, meaning the interaction between uh, the income elasticity of a good and the intertemporal of, of the same good to build the model. In this model, this is a two-agent New Keynesian model where we add on top non-homothetic preferences and uh, labor market heterogeneity. We use the model to quantify our channel and also to show when non-homotheticity matters for amplification and when it does not. What we show is that in, if it does not interact with relevant heterogeneity, such as in the representative agent New Keynesian model, non-homotheticity will not matter for amplification. Okay, so let's dive in into the meat of the paper. I will skip the literature for sake of time and go directly into measurement. Now, we want to create this time series for essential and essential consumption, prices, and labor earnings. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to classify whether consumption categories are essential or non-essential. And the definition is a good is a non-essential if the income elasticity of demand is greater than one. How do we do that? We run angle curves on CX data, and then we can create a classification of consumption categories. An example of essential is food at home or utilities. An example of non-essential is food away from home, like going to the restaurant. With this classification, we then map this uh, and we merge this to PCE data in order to create a time series of consumption, of consumption quantity, and uh, prices for essential and non-essential. What we show is that 36% of expenditure are essential, 44% are non-essential, and 20% is left unclassified, where we cannot classify things like banking services, where we don't have good data on the CX. Now, we have now consumption data, but we also, also get uh, uh, labor market uh, classification. And for this, we need to classify both final sectors and intermediate uh, producing sectors. Now, if you work in a final producing sector, like you work in a restaurant, it's easy to classify whether you are a worker who sells essential or non-essential, but it becomes harder if you work in an intermediate producing sector. To classify those sectors, we take the input-output matrix from the BEA, we run a Leontiev inverse, and so we see whether downstream an intermediate sector mainly sells toward essential or non-essential. With this classification, we then merge this to the CPS data and build essential and non-essential employment and earnings. In our data, we have 62% of employments, which is non-essential, 30 with essential, and eight, which is unclassified. Okay, so this is how we create our data set. What do we do with this? We look first at a monetary policy shock. In this case, as our baseline, we use the Gertrude and Karadi uh, shock. Then we also show robustness to the Yerochinsky and Karadi shock in a robustness check. In our baseline, we take this shock, we run the same proxy var, and then we extract the, monetary policy sh the structural monetary policy shock in an approach that Paul has used in another paper. Then we use the structural monetary policy shock in a smooth local projection IV uh, pro done by Barney, Sean, and Braulis. What does this do? Well, we, I, we instrument a change in the one-year rate, and we have some outcome variables that we care about, let's say consumption of essential or non-essential, and the smooth part simply goes in between LP and VAR, 
but we can interpret them as local projection results. And we try to use our, stand, our standard control and we try to maximize our sample whenever possible. So we start uh, for, uh, for, from 73 for consumption, 76 for employment, 78 for pricing, 82 for earnings. However, crucially, in our baseline exercise, we cut our sample before COVID. Why? Because in COVID, the government did lockdowns, which basically forced people to not be able to consume non-essentials, and we don't want to contaminate our results from government is lockdown. If we include COVID, the results become even stronger. Okay, so this is the empirical approach. What do we find? Here, I'm showing you the effect of a 1% increase in interest rate on consumption. And for now, I want, to, I want you to focus on the blue lines, which are the outcome, which are the impulse response function from, uh, the, from the LP. Now, I guess many people in this room will have run the regression on the first panel. This is the aggregate response of consumption to a 1% increase in interest rate. Consumption falls by about 0.6, 0 0.7% after two to three years. Now, this is something that many of you have seen already, but this is not our contribution. Our contribution is uh, what is under the red, uh, under the red uh, square. And here we split between essential and non-essential consumption. What we see is that people cut their essential consumption much less than the aggregate one. Essential consumption declines only about uh, 0.3 or 0.4% following two years after the shock, whereas non-essential consumption declines much more by about 0.8 or 0.9. If you wonder whether the difference between these two impulse response functions is statistically different from zero, well, this is the last panel here where we plot the ratio, and the ratio becomes negative at minus 0.5, and is clearly different from zero. I told you to focus on the blue line, which is the empirical LP, but you can see also some red line in the background. Well, I will not have time to discuss the, uh, how we do model estimation, but these are the impulse response function from our structural model where we can match the empirical one. And this is the first result on consumption. But then we also have one result, and we think it's an even more striking result, on labor earnings. Following a 1% increase in interest rate, labor earnings declined by about 3.5% after three to four years following the shock. Now, there is aggregate effect mask a huge heterogeneity. If you work in producing essential goods and services, you are really are not affected by a monetary policy shock. There is no statistically different um, from zero effect on the labor earning of people who produce essential. All of the Fed goes through non-essential, where these people lose about 5% of their labor earnings three years after the shock. And clearly, the ratio between these two is different from zero and negative. What I showed you until now, though, are only aggregate results. What we want to dive into next is what about heterogeneity? Who is losing their job? Who is losing their labor earnings? And to do this, we dive into the heterogeneity across, um, across, this, across uh, earning, earning the size. OK, the first fact, which is what I showed at the beginning of the presentation, is that poorer households are more likely to work and produce non-essential than richer households. And this is in the cross-section. What about in the time series? Here I'm showing you always the same effect of a 1% increase in interest rate, but rather than showing you a full uh, impulse response function, I'm cutting the horizon at three years after the shock, and I'm contrasting how rich you are, from poorer households to richer households, for those who work in essential and non-essential. The first result is that if you work in producing essential, there is a mildly negative but not statistically different uh, from zero effect of, on your labor earnings, and crucially, this does not change throughout the income distribution. Whether you're rich or poor, you lose a little bit of your labor earnings, but really not much. On the other hand, we see a huge heterogeneity on non-essentials. If you are a richer household who produces non-essential, you don't really see a decline in your labor earnings. All of this decline that we saw in the aggregate is coming from poorer households who produce non-essential. Again, an example might be servers to fix ideas. And this may be one possible explanation for counter-cyclical income inequality. Why do we see, we see higher uh, uh, inequality in recession? Well, because it's those people who are losing their job. This result is robust. We try, including the, we try to include the, the information effect for, for monetary policy. 
we look at broader business cycle shocks to argue that this is not only a monetary policy transmission channel, but this is a amplification of business cycle more broadly. We try to see whether other consumption categories can confound it. We don't find evidence. We, are, we run with alternative sample, with alternative econometric methodologies, but overall these results carry through. Next, I want to show you a model to rationalize uh, what we have found. And uh, the idea of the model is let's take a two agents new Keynesian model and add two new ingredients. The first one, because we are talking about essential and non-essential, is non-homothetic preferences. Our non-homothetic preferences are very similar, are very simple, and where people like to consume essential, they like to consume non-essential, and they have a CRRA utility on essential and non-essential. Crucially, our, our important assumption, this is an additive, and they don't like to work. Now, in, with this preference, but more generally for any separately additive preference, we have that the good with a higher intertemporal assist substitution is also a luxury or a non-essential. What's the intuition here? As long as I go on vacation, I really don't care when I go. So this is easier to anticipate and postpone than an essential. I really want to eat and have grocery shopping and have my house which is warm or, or, or cold in the summer, and I don't really want to shift this intertemporally. And so we are using this intuition to bring this to the intertemporal assist substitution, which is clearly a very important parameter in the in, um, in new Keynesian model. And this is a general result which was proved by Browning and Crossley for any separately additive uh, uh, utility function. Our function here just makes it very easy and very transparent. And then in addition to that, we had the labor market heterogeneity. We have two types of workers. We have low productivity workers who are also end to mouth and they are more likely to work in producing non-essential. And we have high productivity workers who are also Ricardian who are more likely to work in the essential sectors. So these are the two new ingredients. The other ingredients of this model are quite standard. So for Hauser, we have sticking attention in the monkey rice style to match the hump shape response in consumption. We have Ricardian agents who receive profit in order to do the two agents new Keynesian model. And then we have two firms, uh, one for each sector, and the only way they differ is how many, how many low income worker they hire compared to how many high income worker they hire. But then they have uh, sticky prices with the same price stickiness. The government is also borrowing. There is a central bank with a tailor rule and a transfer and profit rule. What do we find? Well, first, we can match our impulse response function when we, do model when we do model estimation. And these are the red line that I showed you before, where inside the empirical impulse response function. Also, we are bringing this an estimation for the difference in the intertemporal elasticity substitution between essential and non-essential. And to the best of our knowledge, we are the first to do this in a macro setting or with a macro estimation. What do we find? Well, we find that the difference in the income intertemporal substitution of the non-essential and the essential, or gamma n minus gamma e, is 0 0.687, and this is statistically different from zero. This is, we think, a reasonable but uh, non-trivial non -trivial magnitude for this. And we can match the, imp the impulse response function. Okay, now we have a model. What we do with the model is we run a counterfactual to see which of the channels we introduced makes is, mo is, the most, is the most important and is driving our aggregate results. And we re realize that we have three key features of this model on top of the standard uh, textbook version of the new Keynesian model. We have non homothetic preferences, hand to mouth households, and uh, earning inequality among workers, meaning some people work more in one sector and other people work more in the other sector. In the counterfactual, what we do is we switch all of the features off and then we add them one by one, we add them back one by one. What do we find? Two key results. First one is, is there really the interaction between non homotheticity and earning inequality that is key to drive our amplification on both consumption and earnings? Whereas each one on its own doesn't really drive much aggregate amplification. Also, what we show both in the counterfactual example but also analytically is that non homothetic preferences on their own wouldn't drive amplification, meaning you have more intertemporal substitution from one good 
and then of another, but as long as you are in a representative agent, the only thing that matters for R gate amplification is the average intertemporal substitution, and the split between the two goods becomes irrelevant. Okay, let me show you what we do in this, in this counterfactual with numbers. So in this table, I show you the cumulative impulse response function for consumption under our model, our estimated model, which we use as a benchmark. Our estimated model has heterogeneous agents, earning inequality, and non-homotaticity. So we take the cumulative impulse response function, and then we divide what we have, what we have uh, in each other case by our estimated model. So our end game is to arrive to a one here. Where do we start from? A textbook version of the New Keynesian model where we have homotetic preferences, a representative agents, and therefore there is only one sector. What do we find there? Well, we find that uh, aggregate amplification is much lower, only 22%. Only and now we're gonna start from here and then let's add uh, one by one the various, uh, uh, the various features. So the first feature is let's start from the representative agent and let's add non homotaticity What do we find? No change in amplification, no change in aggregate consumption, and this is not only a feature of our numerical case, we proved that this is a case analytically. Now what in the other hand, we start again from the homotetic representative agents, and we do what the literature on, on two agents, new heterogeneous agents models has been doing, meaning let's add hand-to-mouth households. Well in this case, we do see a fairly big jump from 22% to 35%, and this is in the order of what uh, Patterson or Bilby have found in terms of magnitude, of like 50% more amplification comp going from the representative agent to the, to the heterogeneous agents model, but clearly this doesn't yet arrive uh, to, our full, to our full results. Okay, so now let's start now from the standard two-agent Newcation model, and let's add non homotaticity on top. Do we go somewhere? Well, we increase a little bit amplification, but almost nothing. The only reason why this increases a bit is because uh, the Ricardian agents have a little bit higher IS because they consume mainly an essential, but this is clearly not enough to drive, uh, uh, to, to arrive to our, to our estimated model. So what if we move from 35 then to having also earning inequality? Well, we do see something, but this is only 12 percentage points, which is, again, nowhere near what we need to arrive to our case. It's only when we add both non homotaticity and earning inequality that we arrive to the overall amplification. And this is because there is an interaction between these two features. People cut non essential. Why does this matter? Because it's poor households who work and produce there. And this is the result from the counterfactual simulation. And with this, I think I can conclude even in a little early. What do we do in this paper? Well, we do three things. The first is creating new macro time series for producing for essential and non-essential. And with them, we identify a new, uh, a new channel of business cycle amplification. After a contractionary shock, non-essential consumption declines. This matters because this disproportionately affects low-income workers who mainly work in producing non-essentials. And the joining these two is what is, what is driving amplification. In tier, we bring this intuition and we build a model which has both non homotaticity and labor market heterogeneity in G. Now, we are at a conference um, at the ECB, so I guess I must say something about uh, the, what is the policy implication of all, of all of this. Well, why should we care about it? Because we think first this is an important, this is an important uh, driver of business cycle amplification. However, I will not leave you with a very clear cut uh, implication for conduct of monetary policy because it's not clear how this direction would go. Because on, you know, on one hand, having low-income workers working in non-essential would drive whether should you, should you target their consumption or their labor earnings. And so the fact that you have non-essential and essential would differ not only across the intertemporal substitution, but across the labor market and potentially price stickiness, each might have an important effect for optimal monetary and fiscal policy, and so we don't have a clear-cut way of saying the ECB should more target essential or essential consumption or prices. Thank you. Thank you, Michele. So, Peter, you have 15 minutes for your discussion. 
So let me, let me start by thanking the organizers for, for having me uh, discuss this paper. Uh, I really enjoyed reading it. It's really a kind of a full, full package paper with, uh, with very, very interesting uh, results. I, I learned a lot and the uh, usual, usual disclaimer applies. So, so the, just, just quickly, uh, the, the overview of the paper. So it, it really proposes and brings collaborating evidence for a, a novel business cycle amplification mechanism. And the, the components of this mechanism is that there uh, is so, so non-essential uh, sectors. So non-essential good producing sectors are more sensitive to business cycle fluctuations than uh, essential sectors. Uh, also, uh, not the, the second component, and it also provides new evidence on, on this, is that workers in these new, new uh, non-essential sectors earn less than, uh, than those in essential sectors. Uh, actually, I want to point out uh, is that, that these are not the frontline and not frontline uh, workers during COVID. So, so there, if you, if you look at the, what, what people called essential there, they were actually have had uh, uh, usually lower wages than, than otherwise. But here, the issue is not the frontline versus non-frontline, it's really the whole production process of the, of the essentials and the non-essentials. Non uh, and uh, the, the third point of the paper, and, and this is, I, I would say, uh, I will talk about later more, more an assumption, is that the workers in these non-essential sectors who have, uh, the authors show, have lower, uh, lower earnings uh, are assumed to have higher MPCs, so they, they are, they are hand-to-mouth. And they, they provide a, a new theoretical model uh, and uh, they, they show that uh, the three-way inter uh, interaction of the components are necessary to actually have quantitatively uh, meaningful amplification of the, of, the, of the business cycles. So I, I really like the paper. I think I, uh, this is also a paper that, that uh, everyone should, should look at. It's really a convincing story and it's, uh, it, it has kind of a, a potential to become kind of the main, main story of when, when one partitions uh, the, the, the sector in, into sectors, so potentially more important than looking at durables, non-durables, manufacturing services, uh, tradable, non-tradable, if when we are looking at kind of business cycle uh, amplification sector in, uh, uh, analysis. And, and it's really a, a kind of well-executed well well paper. So in, in terms of my comments, because uh, it's, a, it's a discussion, so I, I kind of need to, need to look at uh, uh, kind of the issues of the paper. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm going to start with, uh, with kind of talking about uh, relationship to the to relevant literature, in particular one, one paper. Uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about one issue which, which was not raised uh, in, the, in the presentation and it's, it's the heterogeneity in the price uh, and wage rigidity across, across sectors, uh, issues about earnings and, and MPC, and then I will start with the you know, kind of unfair question of, of why, why should we care. So, the, the, so, so there is a related story already uh, uh, proposed in the literature, uh, and that's the, uh, a paper of uh, Yaimovic, Rebello, and Wong about trading down uh, during business cycle. And there the, the idea is that, that uh, households actually substitute to lower quality uh, goods in, in recessions, and they also point out that there is heterogeneity between production of lower quality versus higher quality goods. In, in particular, their point is that uh, lower quality goods use less labor. So then when, when the, the, the demand for, for, uh, for lower quality goods gets higher, then there is, there is a drop in, in, uh, in, in labor demand, and that kind of feeds back and amplifies amplifies the, the business cycle. And, and the, 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 the story that the authors provide is different, but what I would say it's related. So, so they are, so, so this story is about within sector substitution, while the author's story is, is kind of across, across sector substitution. But we, we kind of know that, uh, that elasticity of substitution within sector is, is, can be potentially much higher than, than elasticity of substitution uh, across sectors. So, so it's kind of, if, if, I, if I want to buy a, a, a kind of milk, then, then going to a kind of a lower quality milk is, is probably easier than, than kind of really changing my behavior 
uh, in the in the crisis. So so I think it it might be important to to kind of look at the relative relevance of the two mechanism, even though they are complementary, uh, and uh, and and kind of assess whether so how, how important uh, they are and and whether kind of looking at trading down is is there kind of big room for to to explain the the kind of the, the across sector uh, substitution. So the second uh, uh, point is, is kind of heterogeneity in, in price and wage stickiness. So, so the paper, uh, the, the current version of the paper assumes homogeneity, homogeneity across sectors in, in, in price and, and wage stickiness, but in, it, it, it can potentially be uh, important. So if, if you have heterogeneity, it can affect the amplification uh, in, the, in the model. So for example, if the, if the prices of essentials drop, uh, during downturns, then then the it leaves leaves more room for for non-essential spending to to drop less. So that uh, that is uh, that is potentially a mechanism that that kind of change the so not the not potentially not qualitatively but quantitatively the the, the strengths of the mechanisms. And and actually the the paper uh, in the appendix they 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 provide evidence of of what happens to to these prices. They they have. Uh, I mean, they, they, they did their homework, and it's, the, the, they actually could look at also prices in there. And, 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 but actually here, what you, what you can see is that, that actually there is a kind of big heterogeneity uh, in the prices. So essential prices uh, drop uh, sizably on impact, uh, while, while the non-essential kind of uh, uh, decline, decline smaller. Uh, and, and, and another potential way of, of going about this is to look at uh, microdata. And here what I, what I did is that, uh, so, so Nakamura and Stenson, uh, in their paper, they, they, uh, they look at, uh, in the US, different uh, uh, price change frequency measures across different sectors. So they, they have like three, around 300 sectors, I, I kind of, uh, I tried to do it myself to put put these into into the essential sectors that the that the authors uh, um, uh, uh, characterize. So, so the, here and what you see is that uh, the frequency, the average frequency in the essential sector is around 40 percent, and this is much higher than the average of, of all of them, which is like 20 percent. So so this is. Uh, kind of also in line with the previous uh, evidence that, that there is a, a substantial difference between the, the frequency of price changes in the two sectors and two, two sets of sectors. And this is not that surprising. They, they have used cars and, and gas and utilities. They, these, are, these are known to be sectors with, uh, with frequent uh, price adjustments. Uh, so turning to kind of earning earning distributions, it's 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 really I, I really uh, was amazed the, by the results that the authors uh, document. So they find that that earnings in the non-essential. So these are these are kind of the luxury sectors that we uh, we, we sometimes model as, uh, as 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 providing differentiated goods. Here they find that in the data, the these sectors have uh, workers with lower earnings. Than, than in essential sector, and, uh, and this is a, a figure uh, uh, from the paper uh, looking at this. I, I think uh, it, it would be important to, to show a bit more robustness uh, how, what, what, which sectors uh, drive these results. So I think if, if they could report earning distributions by major sectors and, and see, because in some sense, it's just important to see whether the, the particular categorization that they ended up using is, so how much it, it matters in, in, in changing, changing these results. And another, I mean, on my wish list is that, is there a story that they, that they have and, and, and potentially could look at where it is that this relationship is really a consequence of some deep features of being an essential versus a non-essential sector or this is just kind of happens to be the case. So is, is, this, is this something that, that there is some uh, difference in the production process of, of, of producing essentials and, and, and non-essentials that make it, make, make this different uh, difference uh, kind of really kind of comes from the primitives or, or this is just something that, 
that is that is like that, and it might be that that it's different, for example, in other countries, or or uh, that or which uh, which would be important to know. Also, that uh, the model assumes that low productivity uh, and low earning agents has have high MPC, and I think this is this is a very reasonable assumption, and we know that that MPC does decrease with, with income over, on average. However, we, we know from previous research, it's also from the authors, that, that income itself is not a sufficient statistic. So you, you have the kind of high income, high hand to mouth agent. So, so it's, it's, it's also kind of, I, I, I'm a bit missing the smoking gun that to, to really show that, that these are kind of the, in the non-essential sectors, the, the MPC is really higher. Than, than in the essential sector, but I, I understand that empirically this is this is a, this is a hard uh, thing to to prove. Okay, so the my my third point is is kind of a the, I, I would say it's a it's a, it's an unfair question, uh, but the, the question is why why should we care? I uh, I, I think we should care uh, because we we really are about to improve the understanding of, of the uh, reality, and I, I really do believe that a good story uh, it really improves the attractiveness of a, of a theoretical framework. However, I think if, if, if our goal is to arrive about to, to uh, the simplest realistic model, uh, and we are interested in, for example, policy, policy conclusions, then uh, the, the question is whether a, a model that has kind of more simpler amplification mechanisms, like just the textbook Nukensian model or, or Hang model, which is estimated, would it, uh, uh, it, it can potentially capture uh, the, the same business cycle co-movements than, than this paper. So in, in some sense, what, what, I would, what, what I think would be, would be very interesting to see whether are, are there kind of new key business cycle puzzles that this model can explain while, while these kind of more standard, uh, standard models can. So why, why do we kind of need to make our model, our existing model more complicated to incorporate this, this particular uh, way of amplification? What, what are, we, oh, are we gaining for that? And, and, and why, yeah. I'm, I'm saying it's unfair because it kind of comes from a particular uh, way of, of, uh, of looking at models. Okay, so just just to conclude, I, I think it's a it's a it's a great paper uh, with a very convincing story. It, it provides a, a structural model and uh, and also supporting evidence. And uh, I just basically listed a couple of wish lists. I, I think it's it's uh, it would be important important to point out the the importance relative to kind of within sector trading down. Uh, it's it's also important to check, uh, especially in the in the model, the robustness to to heterogeneity in wage and uh, and price stickiness, uh, and uh, it it would be it would be good to uh, kind of get closer to to proving that that really there is MPC uh, difference uh, between the sectors, and uh, and and finding puzzles, important puzzles that the model uh, solves. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Michele, okay. you want to respond? Yeah, thank you for the discussion. I mean, this is a great discussion. This gives us a number of things to, uh, to think about. Um, let, me, let me maybe reply to a couple of points. Relationship to the literature and to trading down in the business cycle paper. I, I, I agree, you know, I, I really like that paper, and I think what we are doing is complementary to what, uh, to what they are doing, because they're looking whether somebody trades down, changes the quality of what they buy, in uh, when, there is a, when there is a recession. And to me, it makes a lot of sense, and it seems that the idea is similar. You know, what I, I, can, I don't need sushi now, I can go and eat pasta, and uh, pasta and beans when there, is, when there is a recession. And the overall, idea is, the overall idea is the same. However, we have a trade-off when we go into granularity versus universality of uh, the consumption basket, and then the implication for macro. The cost of uh, going into very granular detail, well, the benefit of being very granular is that you can really see whether people buy sushi versus uh, pasta, but the cost is that you cannot then match uh, across the whole economy, both for consumption or consumption categories, but more important for la the labor market. Because in that way, you lose, you lose all of the intermediate inputs, and you lose everybody who works in the intermediate inputs, and so there is a 
to me, there is a trade-off between going very granular or being a bit coarser, but then seeing the universe of all workers and all consumption category. One thing, um, we actually can get our result even with the zero elasticity of substitution across the two goods, because this is what uh, implicitly we're assuming uh, with an additive utility, a ut utility function. So we do get that people cut the non-essential, not because there's a high elasticity of substitution between essential and non-essential, just because they can postpone it and they can just avoid consu consuming that. On heterogeneity in price and wage stickiness, I mean, I agree, I take, we, I, I take the point and I think it would be a natural extension of introducing wage and price stickiness in the model because there could be relevant, heter relevant heterogeneity. Uh, we can match overall the path, of, uh, the, the path of prices even when we are assuming that prices are, have the same stickiness. So for this, version, for this paper we are mainly, you know, this already a bit, there's already quite a few things, so we are mainly pushing to the idea of let's keep it as simple as possible to tell a story. But I think that quantitatively would be very important to add uh, uh, price stickiness, and thank you for giving us the, the, the estimate. Um, on, the, on which sector should drive the result? It's in the, the to-do list. We want to see exactly among all of the final good sector whether they are mainly, there's many poorer or richer people working in each one of the sectors, and we would like to do that. In terms of deep relationship, I think there probably is. I think we should ask to the structural transformation literature what is the reason why are poorer household more likely to work in, uh, in, um, or work in, in non-essential than richer households. So for us, uh, what we want to do is we say, let's, let's take this as given, and then let's see what is the business cycle amplification. I don't have a good reason why that might be, you know, there could be potential different reasons might be the case, and I think that will be something interesting uh, um, in the structural transformation literature to see why they might, might, they, might, they might arise. However, I think that our conclusion are, for whatever reason we are having, now we see that these poor people who work in non-essential, and when they lose their job, uh, they cut their, cut, their, their cut their consumption, so we think that our channel exists independent of what is the deep, the deep structural reason, but I, I agree that would be an interesting paper, um, an interesting paper to write. In terms of MPC is true, we don't show here directly that poorer households have higher MPC. We bring this as uh, some, 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 uh, some agreement that in the literature, because what is true that there are some richer households who have high MPC, like the wealthy and Tumaut. I think even the work of Christina Patterson broadly shows that poorer household, when we try to estimate their MPC, or in the work, actually, another paper that I wrote with Paolo, we do see that uh, uh, poorer households generally tend to have a higher MPC than richer households when we try to, when we try to estimate or the Yapelli pistaferi type, type of evidence. That is why here we are not bringing new direct evidence for this and we are taking this um, as given. Uh, why should we care? I think it's always important to, it's always important to ask. Um, and why should we care? For now, it's understanding is true. It's only, under, it's only understanding a little bit better the transmission of, of uh, business cycle. But this is what we don't have yet, which is the optimal policy part. Why should we care? Because for doing targeted fiscal policy and potentially for monetary policy to think differently about different type of price indices, we really need to go the extra step. Why I don't think we can make the conclusion now? Because the labor market and the consumption side point to two different, uh, uh, two different results. On one hand, maybe monetary policy should care more about uh, the inflation of uh, non-essential because it's where high MPC, low-income people work, and so if they stabilize consumption and inflation of, of non-essential, we see less fluctuation there. The cost of that is that they, you do this by subsidizing the consumption of the rich, and so then the distributional consequences would go in the opposite direction. This is why we think this is not a straightforward question that we can answer without doing optimal policy seriously, but I think that is the next step that you know, we, should, we should take into account. Thank you. Okay. Are there any, of course? <laughs> uh, Ricardo? Given this difference in the essential and non-essential sectors, and especially the striking fact that you have different kinds of workers, you went on the direction of income differences, and a little like Peter said, then made the jump to MPCs. But that isn't, I worry whether you're a little a hostage of the recent literature and your own work on Hank Malls and others. I would think that, for instance, a pro probably a very big difference here is gender. We know that males and females work in different industries. 
Um, I would expect that the, what you label the essentials, non essentials, is going to have a very large composition in terms of the gender of who the workers are. I think you're going to find bigger even than your earnings. And we know that different genders have very different elasticities of labor supply. So they may be uh, as promising or more to understand essentials, non essentials in terms of whether the labor supply choices and employment dynamics of women versus men. Um, in terms of propaganda, business cycle, and the role of essentials, as opposed to an NPC aggregate demand channel. So I would suggest you look at some of those. But it's not obvious to me that if I do the essentials and essentials, I want to look at poor versus rich people, as opposed to women versus men, okay. uh, who I think will distinguish even more across these sectors. Gonzalo, here. Thank you. Thank you. So Gonzalo Pazpardo, ECB. So. I wanted to ask about the relationship of these non-essentials with non-durable, the non-durable, non-durable difference. Because, I mean, I guess you will tell me that you find more striking difference between essentials and non-essentials, but it's still true that non-durables have very particular demand dynamics because there's this discoupling between consumption and expenditure. So if I'm in a recession, maybe I go out less to eat, but then I go a bit more. But thinking about the durable, I just don't buy a car and suddenly the year after everyone's buying a car together and that might generate like uh, different dynamics in demand. So basically the, the EIS is a bit different. So how do they relate? Thanks. Diego. Thanks. Um, I think it's very interesting. Um, I would like to push on this fact that you mentioned about the non-essentials being intensive in, in Poor, poor workers and skilled workers. In, in the paper that you cite of us about income-driven labor market polarization, you know, we show that when you separate between three types of workers, low skill, medium, and high, actually there is an, a, 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 a U-shaped relation between income elasticity of the man of the sectors that you work and the skill of the workers. Okay, let me, let me just finish. So um, accommodation and restaurants is very income elastic, okay? The elasticity is 1.3. Uh, manufacturing and agriculture is less income elastic, and then you have you know high skill sectors like you know like professional services and and and, and uh, um, health and education that are very income elastic. So so I think that if you allow and we show that if you allow for more work for for more for a thinner classification of workers, then uh, you are going to have uh, you know more effects on the medium skill than the others. Second comment I have is that. Your, the way the way you model uh, the demands for different sectors, uh, you know, it's, it's a bit strange. Typically, in the structural transformation literature, we tend to think of uh, uh, utility across periods as the one that it enters into the earlier equation, and then you have an intra 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 temporal problem that is the one that defines how. Instead, you have a different earlier equation for each sector, and I'm, I'm you know. I, I, I'm not sure what to make of that. Like, you know, there are a few things that we, we tend to like about the, the way we write demand systems in, in the structural transformation literature. In particular, income effects shouldn't, shouldn't, should last for a long time. They, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't disappear. Um, uh, but, but if that's the case, then, you know, you have an, a challenge, which is that the system is not going to be uh, stationary, okay? Like, you know, and so I, I'm really not sure with this structure you have, I'm not sure where, where you fit into that quadrant. So. It's certainly not conventional, let me say that. Thank you. There's a question here. Yeah, uh, Janko Heineken, University of Bonn. Piggybagging a bit on the discussion and the previous question, it would be really nice to see the breakdown of the, like the overlap of non-essential versus essential with all the other categories that we've seen, just as a summary statistic. Because, uh, I mean, if I think about the investment channel, Right. If I think about manufacturing versus uh, services, I wonder how much this is competing with your wage channel, in a sense. And I think you have all the tools to check essential, non-essential investment responses, and then horse races in your maybe you already did it. Horse races in your model to think about what is really is your channel driving it? Is more an investment channel through non-essentials driving it? Yeah. It's in the slide appendix. I don't know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Take a look at the paper there. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't see any other questions, so can you please respond? Okay, um, yeah, thanks for all of the questions. Um, Ricardo, gender, yeah, point taken. I think it's, it, would be, it, would be, it would be very interesting uh, to look at gender. I think on the CPS, we might have it, but I am not sure. The, our data limitation is what we can get on the labor market information. 
And it would be very interesting to see if we had data, which I don't think is there, whether we have married women versus unmarried women, married men versus unmarried men, because there is a potential very strong difference in terms of labor, of, um, labor supply elasticity. Uh, but I think it's a, we take a point and we can actually can check it. I think it would be super interesting to see that. Um, on Gonzalo, on the non-essential versus durable, non-durable, also here we think it's very important to discuss uh, diff how the non-essential essential split is different from the durable, non-durable, because it's true that people cut their, non their durable consumption and durables are more likely to be um, non-essential. So this is a, a, a potential concern that what we are actually capturing is not essential and essential, but is durable, non-durable. So we answer this in two ways. First, we look at uh, only within non-durables, what do we see? And why do we think it's important? Because durables are 15% of the consumption bundle and non-durables are, are 85%. And essential, non-essential is 50-50. And even when we are looking only within uh, uh, non-durable, we see much stronger responses of non-durable, non-essential compared to non-durable, non-durable essential. Also, and we think this is even more striking, uh, is we do not see the same labor market uh, relationship. It is true that non-durable, non-essential workers are poorer than everybody else, servers. It is not true that uh, durable, non-essential workers are poorer than everybody else. They are pretty much the same. So the labor market channel, we don't think is present with durable and non-durable. And with Yanko, we, 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 we can maybe discuss later. We, try, we tried uh, goods versus services, tradable, non-tradable, uh, so it's... Uh, and we, we see some, the split wouldn't be able to explain, at least we don't think that it would be able to explain the durable, the essential non essential uh, split. And on, uh, on Diego, um, okay, so there is two, com two, two comments. The first, let me take the second one, the one for the demand function that you're using. Point taken, this would not be a good demand function to do structural transformation because there, it doesn't, you know, the, C, the sum of CRA wouldn't have stationarity. As people become richer, they would converge to no, 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 non, no essential and only non-essential consumption. So this is, this we couldn't take this type of, uh, of utility function to a structural transformation um, approach exactly because of that. However, we are looking at around that linear, uh, linearized equilibrium where around the steady state, for a business like we think that uh, this is a reasonable approximation or a reasonable utility function where we do not have uh, any trend growth. This result of the relation between essential and non-essential income elasticity and intertemporal substitution would hold for any separately additive uh, utility function which we think that this is, more bro this is broader than the simple sum of zero array, which just shows the intertemporal substitution in, you know, in, one, in one parameter. But actually, it's on the to-do list to use your preferences to see how the, sto how the story would go if, uh, if no, that's actually, in the, that's been in the, it's also been in our, in our, in our to-do list to see how this, uh, this works. In terms of the non-essential and essential, who is the poor, poorer worker and the richer worker, so what we tried is we are looking at across all percentiles. So we are not fitting a linear, we are not fitting a linear relationship uh, between uh, more essential good, more non-essential good, and whether you are poorer or richer. We are looking across all essential good and across all of the percentiles among the poorest percentile, the next poorest percentile, in the proportion of people who are working essential and non-essential. And we do see it looks linear, but we, we are not imposing any, any linearity in our, in our uh, you know, you know in our analysis, where we do see that, uh, on average, poorer houses are more likely to work in non-essential than essential. But if okay. okay, so um, we've made it to the end of the inaugural conference of the Challenges for Monetary Policy Transmission in a Changing World Research Network, for short, uh, the CHAMP Research Network. I'm sure that we can all agree that uh, it was a great success. We brought together researchers from academia, from central banks, and of course, from our network to address the complexities and challenges of monetary policy transmission. Uh, I'm sure that both the academic sessions and also the poster sessions, I hope you had the chance and the time to look at our poster sessions, and of course, the policy panel 
gave us a lot to think uh, and to talk about and will be a big input, an important input for our network uh, going forward. Um, I was part of the very first Eurosystem-wide uh, research network back in the day. <laughs> um, and um, that was the beginning, the early days of the monetary union, the Eurosystem, and at that time, the challenges we faced uh, looked huge um, without knowing what was going to happen uh, during the last 22 years. Um, and when I think about how we did the network at that time, we also had, we had two work streams. One was looking at the interest rate pass-through using individual bank data, and the other one was looking at the bank lending channel using bank and firm level data. Uh, Anna Credit, B2B, were not in our vocabulary. Uh, and of course, a lot of the transmission channels that we know exist right now were not really under our radar at that time. Uh, so we have learned some, a lot new uh, channels. Uh, today I learned about two new channels. I knew that there was a deposit beta channel, but now we know that there's a deposit franchise channel. I knew that there was a risk-taking channel. Now we know that there was a climate risk-taking channel. Um, and I must also say, when we did the MTN, the legendary MTN, we would never think that climate t topics would be something we were allowed to think about. Uh, so we have come a long way from those early days, and I think that the conference today was a big and first step towards a better understanding of the challenges of transmission mechanism. And this is just the start of our network. So imagine what is going to happen in the next year or two years with all those researchers uh, working together. Uh, looking ahead, uh, as you can see in the slide, we have in the network a very busy schedule for our uh, members. We have a lot of training sessions. Uh, and also workshops where we can discuss uh, research at early stages. And of course, at later stages, uh, we will present um, the research of the, of the network in academic sessions, um, in, in conference, in academic conferences. And of course, we will disseminate uh, our results in working papers and hopefully uh, also in journal articles. So um, last but not least, uh, on behalf of the CHAMP board, who is partly here still. I would like to thank all the participants, all the speakers, uh, discussants, um, the organizers, the people in the back, uh, the trainees that made possible that it was a lively discussion, and of course our scientific committee for the hard work and the contributions uh, that made this conference a real success. Thanks uh, and goodbye. Have a